my dear catechists in the previous video we tried to have a general understanding of sacraments uh, paying attention to important elements and here I'm going to discuss with you uh, some individual sacraments uh, some of them as they are mentioned in your syllabus so we'll start with baptism uh, in the first slide you will see uh, the brief kind of introduction given by the Catechism of the Catholic Church about baptism. It says it's a vite spiritualis nua. It's a gateway to the life in the spirit. And baptism is called by that name because baptizing with water is the central action that is taking place in the sacrament of baptism. And then there is also the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. It takes place uh, in baptism. 12.16 says, it is called enlightenment, enlightenment because you know, especially in the case of adult baptism, uh, the uh, reception of the sacrament precede a period of preparation where he is given the basic catechism, he is prepared, so given the light so it is uh, uh, therefore called the uh, uh, sacrament is called the uh, uh, enlightenment and then we have the beautiful explanation given by Saint Gregory of Nazianzus and he gives beautiful images uh, with some beautiful images he explains baptism it's a gift it's a grace it's baptism and anointing enlightenment and clothing bath seal all the events that uh, symbol that take uh, that you can see in the rite of baptism now let us pay attention to what the scriptures say about baptism well there are many uh, references but i will just pay to some of them uh, we'll when we look at the Old Testament, we find that there are many events or uh, occurrences that refer to uh, baptism. Noah's Ark during great floods. We can see it as a sign of salvation by baptism. And say, uh, we find that Noah and his family saved from the floods. And then passage across the Red Sea and liberation from the slavery in Egypt. It also prefigures that event, a Christian baptism in the Old Testament. Crossing of Jordan River by people of Israel to enter Promised Land. And again we take it as an image of eternal life because those who receive baptism they are promised with salvation, eternal life. So this crossing of Red Sea in the Old Testament, we, we, we take it because it's all uh, New T Testament is based on the Old Testament and New Testament also completes the Old Testament. So what is uh, what was mentioned in the Old Testament, we will of course say that was fulfilled and made clear. So here is a good example. Then we pay attention to New Testament institution of the sacrament. We know that Jesus himself underwent baptism at the hand of John the Baptist and uh, he also refers to his own uh, death and resurrection as baptism. If you read Mark uh, 10.38 you will understand it. So institution of baptism by Christ can be seen from three instances in the Gospel. Uh, prediction first, well, uh, prediction of John the Baptist that Christ would found a new and perfect baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire. John was at that time already baptizing. and But then he says, well, there will be a more perfect baptism established, instituted by Christ with the in the Holy Spirit and fire. And in his discourse with Nicodemus, Jesus insisted on the absolute necessity for salvation of regeneration by means of the baptismal rite. So he he tells Nicodemus that unless you be born again uh, through the baptism, through the process of regeneration, uh, you can be a follower or Christian. 
Then on the third, on the day of his ascension, Jesus Christ addressed these solemn words to his apostles. After his resurrection, he says, "Go therefore and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Trinity." So he gave the mandate uh, to the disciples to spread the good news and to baptize. Then in the baptism in the church. from the day of pentecost church has celebrated and administered holy baptism and we find uh, after peter's first sermon after peter's first sermon uh, around 3000 people were baptized so at the from the day of pentecost uh, this uh, apostle start baptizing people Philip the deacon baptized Ethiopian eunuch we read in acts 8 and 38 and Paul receives baptism through the hands of Ananias and his name is also changed baptism was even connected with faith it was seen uh, connected with the f- with faith believe in the lord jesus and you will be saved this is what paul said to the family of jailer in philip when he baptized them and also according to st paul through baptism a believer enters into christ's death and is buried and rises with him and he puts on christ so baptism theology is developed with these words and understanding of paul that baptism would mean to be buried and to rise to a new life so at baptism our old self is uh, removed and we put on a new self and our old life is forgotten and we are we enter into a new life our old sins are forgiven we are cleansed of all our previous sins and especially in the case of adults and uh, then we begin a new life some early christian text bear witness to the existence of baptism in the early church the darken which we consider as the writing of the apostles speak of the rite of immersion in the running water and triple pouring of water on the forehead of the candidates how it was carried out and by immersion and uh, pouring and saint hippolytus's writing describe two or three years of preparation for the sacrament of baptism especially Uh, pre- earlier the adults were baptized so they were not simply called and baptized but they had to go through a kind of a period of preparation formation and we find in the writings of uh, hippolytus that uh, how they went through will then uh, pay little attention to adult baptism initially it was adults who were baptized after a certain period of catechumenate we call that uh, that period catechumenate period of formation which comprises of several stages this whole process is called the christian initiation of adults which culminates in the reception of baptism confirmation and eucharist and thereby full incorporation into the church initially it was all these three sacraments when the adult baptisms took place all these three sacraments were given together and we, we call that whole preparation the christian initiation of adults the catechumen should be properly initiated into the mystery of salvation the practice of christian virtues and they should be introduced into the life of faith liturgy and the charity of people the catechumen of the catholic church explain how this catechumen took place how this formation or training took place what are the areas that the attention was paid to when uh, when these candidates uh, were being prepared then uh, the most suitable time for adult baptism is during the vigil service of holy saturday well that is the ideal moment but sometimes we know if um, for partial reasons the baptism takes place uh, mostly outside the uh, is a service especially in your wedding or some other important thing and then sometimes uh, here and there we find a priest baptizing adults on uh, on the eve of 
Eve service of Holy Saturday because that is the time where it is the moment we celebrate the Jesus' rising to new life, his resurrection. So it is very much, baptism is, as I said, very much connected to uh, this uh, Paschal event. So that could be the ideal moment to celebrate or to receive the sacrament. Then we'll turn on to uh, infant baptism. The practice of infant baptism would have been there from the apostolic times. Well, though we don't have clear mention of infant baptism in the scriptures, but then we find, especially in apostolic times, we hear of whole household being baptized. So all the family, whole family was baptized. So there <coughs> we have example of the family of Cornelius and the family of Stephanas. And we presume that when the household was baptized, well, all of them, all the members in the family, slaves and including children and infants, all of them are baptized. But then we have the clear evidence, written evidence of infant baptism from the late second century onwards. We find them in the writings of the fathers like uh, Tertullian and Oregon. The gratuitousness of the grace of salvation is particularly manifest in infant baptism. We know that baptism is not, uh, I mean, not given to according to our qualifications, right? Not that is our, we are demanding that. But it is a free gift. It's, it shows that God wants to save everybody and he gives it free of charge. So when it is given to infants, unlike in the baptisms where you find that he makes a conscious decision to be baptized, but infant baptism, yes, it shows the, that freeness, that gratuitousness of grace of salvation uh, in the infant baptism. Some reasons for infant baptism in the early church, why they uh, began to baptizing infants, it was believed that baptism was the remedy for physical illness. Well, uh, they were physically also received some kind of healing through baptism. Idea that baptism was necessary for salvation. So before they, I mean, in case of emergency or death, well, it's better to baptize them as early as possible. So to wipe out the original sin, infants were baptized. So that's the reason why in the early church we find the insertion of uh, this infant baptism. Even now we say that the uh, infants should be baptized as early as possible. And then uh, we can also pay attention to Godparents, uh, which is a practice we have today. Uh, it is the duty of the Godparents to help the parents to take the infant for baptism, to help the child to develop his faith and lead him to live a true Christian life. Therefore, the role of Godparents is important. It's not simply being present there. Uh, just like um, just to physically present but then you are given a responsibility to, to nurture and guide this your God uh, your uh, the child in faith as parents have responsibility towards their child uh, God parents also have a responsibility towards the spiritual life of the child the infants are baptized because of the faith uh, the parents have in God. Because just like the parents can make other decisions uh, for the infant. Mm. What to wear, what to eat and all that. So at this moment also they are making that uh, decision on behalf of the child. So it is, it, it is also kind of, it is right. They can do that. Uh, as a child grows up, the godparents should see to the spiritual welfare of the child. So when they give gifts and other things, well, uh, they can uh, see how far they are. They would also be helpful to his spiritual growth and especially with their life example, they have to uh, show them the right way. The Holy Spirit fills us with sanctifying grace which make us partakers of the divine nature. And that's what happens at the baptism. Godparents should have received the sacraments of baptism, confirmation and Holy Eucharist, the three sacraments of initiation. So not that everybody can become 
uh, godparents but then they must come to a certain mature age where they have received all these three sacraments because they should be able to guide the the the, the child who is baptized later the baptism imprints on the soul an indelible spiritual sign which consecrate the baptized for christian worship well it's an it's a mark uh, that is cannot be deleted that cannot be deleted and cannot be revoked so baptism we can't uh, revoke baptism from a child it leaves an indelible mark well uh, then we'll go we'll go to discuss on the effects or the or precisely the grace of baptism what happens to the person who receives baptism he's purified from his sins in the case of infants especially the uh, original sin the seals the christian with the indelible mark you can revoke it that mark is forever and even if he behaves in unchristian manner we cannot revoke the baptism and it begins its union with christ participates in the destiny and the mission of the church right mission of christ now you are union with christ and uh, to suffer and also to spread the kingdom god's kingdom you are kind of uh, uh, you have received uh, the mandate gifts of the holy spirit you will be you will begin to walk enjoy the gifts of the holy spirit membership of the church because you become a catholic or you become a christian and share in the common priesthood of all believers at baptism we are all called to be priests so when one when, when a child is baptized he also shares that common priesthood to offer prayers and uh, give worship to god and participation in the trinitarian life we are baptized in the name of trinity so to live in communion with the others and we are called the new life in the spirit so this marks an important uh, moment because uh, you begin to uh, live a life in the spirit it's not simply a life of flesh but then there is a spirit you come to know that you are guided uh, by the spirit then we have the minister of baptism who is uh, administering the sacrament who has the capacity who has the right the ordinary minister of baptism is bishop priest or a deacon usually they are the they are the ones who are who can uh, administer the sacrament but in certain uh, emergencies in certain circumstances there is also the extraordinary minister and that he could be anyone including a non christian if he has the intention of doing what the church that is if he if he knows that he is baptizing well that is enough something in hospital it has taken place during the time of war sometimes uh, well in case of emergency uh, it has taken place then we have the baptism of blood catechumens that is who are forming and preparing for baptism adults who die before their baptism because of uh, uh, because of their explicit explicit desire because they have being catechumens they have shown that desire okay we are preparing to receive baptism so if they die before baptism well we say that they receive the baptism of blood because traditionally martyrdom uh, was understood as the second baptism so uh, you are baptized with your blood you could be called, because you offer your life uh, for faith and in this case we call it a baptism of blood and christian name received that baptism the name is important because god knows each of us by name though there are so many god knows each one of us so name is important and it also shows the uniqueness uh, of each one of us as persons in baptism a christian receives his or her own name in the church it should preferably be the name of a saint who might offer the baptized a model of sanctity and an assurance of his or her intercession before god well um, we are supposed to add a christian name to our child when uh, he or she is baptized but then we know sometimes it doesn't happen 
but uh, here in our culture, <laughs> yes, some of them are very particular about it, especially I have seen abroad in countries like Italy, well, they are very particular about putting a Christian name and sometimes they put the name of their father or their grandfather, great great uh, grandparents name they use uh, and that is a kind of an uh, honor for them. Then uh, we have the visible signs of baptism. Baptism doesn't play in secret. Yeah, it's a public event. So how does it happen? Well, water is an important symbol in baptism because it is the matter of baptism and we use that water uh, to, through pouring or immersion or sprinkling uh, because Im special immersion in water symbolizes dying and rising to a new life. Water is a symbol of life when you put water to a tree it grows and in the case of tsunami and floods it can also destroy so water has that characteristic giving life and also destroying so in baptism we use the image of immersion that is you go deeper into water and rise up again that is to say that you go you begin a new life then there is anointing uh, there are two anointings take place in baptism oil of with first oil of catechumens you have little bottle mark OC and that is for healing and saving powers and also oil of holy chrism and it marks the call to be a priest and prophet and a king the threefold function of Christ and we share through our baptism and there is baptismal candle and it is a call to be a light to the world radiating, radiating that of risen Christ well, we have little candle which we light up with the pastel candle present, present there. So pastel candle uh, represents uh, the risen Christ. So we take that light, that is, means we are called to radiate the light of risen Christ. Then the white robe is put on, on the child who is baptized, symbolically, that is to put on Christ and you rise with him. Uh, then we'll pay attention to the second sacrament of the sacraments of initiation, the sacrament of confirmation. The sacrament of confirmation together with baptism and Eucharist forms the sacraments of initiation. We know that. Originally it was one single process of initiation with number of actions. As we saw, discuss, uh, it was also given together with baptism originally. So there was baptizing and anointing and laying on of hands. Confirmation marks the completion of baptismal grace. Ah, that is important to understand. Confirmation marks what we uh, marks the completion. That is, it confirms what we have already received. It confirms the already anointed. The word confirmation itself uh, says it. By the sacrament of confirmation, the baptized are more perfectly bound to the church enriched with the special strength of the Holy Spirit and obliged to spread and defend the faith by word and deed. Early rite of priest initiation mainly consisted, consisted two rites that is baptism in the name of Christ, imposition of hands for giving of the Holy Spirit. They were based on events which were interconnected that is, now we are talking about the early Christian initiation. So, Christ event, that is, death and resurrection of Jesus, and also Pentecost, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So, the, uh, these were very clear events that took place in salvation history. And, uh, and then uh, they have made use of all these two events. Both constituted the one and unique promise of salvation. The apostles made provisions to new converts to profit from both events. Well, if you read Acts chapter 8, and there you find that uh, some of uh, the, the faithful, when they had only been baptized, so John and Peter go there to lay hands on them so that they will receive the Holy Spirit. So clearly we find the baptizing and the laying on of hands to marking these uh, two elements, the baptism and confirmation. 
community of the disciples of Christ became the spirit filled community of the disciples after the Pentecost. Well, before Pentecost they were united, but then with the Pentecost coming of the Holy Spirit, they became spirit filled uh, community of disciples. Separate celebration of the two sacraments took place due to increase of infant baptism and rural parishes, growth of dioceses. Okay, now we said uh, they were uh, given together baptism and confirmation, but then with the introduction of infant baptisms, uh, with the growth of parishes and then the growth of dioceses, so the bishop couldn't be uh, present for every infant baptism. So then it has to be administered uh, in a later time. So then we find uh, that the separation of uh, the sacrament of baptism and uh, sacrament of confirmation. We will now try to have a little idea about uh, the Holy Spirit and uh, that we receive uh, at the sacrament of confirmation. Holy Spirit is the third person of the Blessed Trinity. Really God, the same as the Father and the Son. They are so really God. Uh, who is, what is the work of the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit was already at work in the world before Jesus rose and ascended into heaven. To complete the work of salvation of all men, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. He promised the Holy Spirit to continue that, uh, continue the work that he has begun. What did Christ say about the Holy Spirit? Okay. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit. I will ask the Father that he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. He will say then he promised a paraclete to guide us as we get involved in continuing the mission of the Lord. And uh, when did Holy Spirit come into the world? Obviously we know it is on the day of Pentecost. Uh, you read it in Acts chapter 2. Um, then the external sign of confirmation, every, as we discussed earlier, that every sacrament has uh, the external signs. The matter, it is the anointing with chrism, and the form is the verbal formula that follows the anointing, that accompanies the anointing, that is be sealed, you should mention the name, and be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Through confirmation, Christians share more completely in the mission of Christ and receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We said it, 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 the confirmation completes the grace of baptism. So, share completely there in the mission of Christ and also fullness of the Holy Spirit. The confirmed receive the mark, the seal of Holy Spirit. It is also indelible. You don't receive it uh, once again. It Leaves an, leaves an indelible mark. Oh, it's, a, it's a symbol of a person, so you are now connected to that person in a stronger way. And also it's a sign of authority. Seal is a sign of authority. The ownership that you belong uh, to him. right? He works in you. right? You, you work under his guidance. So that mark is, uh, that is what the mark explains in, in confirmation. The rite of confirmation begins with the renewal of baptismal promises and the profession of faith. And that shows that confirmation is connected with uh, baptism. Adults receive confirmation immediately after baptism and take part in the Eucharist. We know that when adult baptism takes place, um, uh, confirmation is given immediately and then go for, go for the Mass to receive the Eucharist. Confirmation is given only once for it, like baptism, leaves an indelible spiritual mark. So you don't repeat this sacrament. You cannot, because it leaves an indelible mark. Uh, you can revoke it either. The matter of the sacrament of confirmation, sorry, the minister of the sacrament of confirmation is the bishop, usually ordinary minister's bishop. But in special circumstances, a priest could be delegated. A priest could impart the sacrament. Especially in adult baptism, we find that it's a priest who is baptizing, confirms the candidate. And there are other occasions where he can delegate some 
vicar general or episcopal vicar for that purpose. The recipient is always a baptized Christian. So, always baptism should precede the sacrament. And late adolescence, that a late teenage could be a more a suitable age for the reception of the sacrament. Here we have also the effects of confirmation. It increases and deepens the grace already received at baptism. It roots us more deeply in the divine filiation which makes us cry Abba Father. It unites us more firmly to Christ. It increases the gift of Holy Spirit in us. It renders our bond with church more perfect. It gives us a special strength to spread and defend faith, especially uh, as adult Christian now you have we have a duty to spread and also due to defend faith. So you are given special strength for that at the confirmation. Then we'll come to discuss the, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I have given a little explanation also. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of fortitude, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of piety and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So you can just go through the explanation and how uh, these gifts begin to uh, work in us, in our life, in our day to day decisions, in our day to day living, uh, confirming that we are not simply physical beings but also we are spiritual beings. So there is a guidance, nourishment that we receive through the Holy Spirit. So these are tangible and these are the means how we receive the, the grace of the Holy Spirit. So I will end our second part of the lesson here. And uh, thank you once again for listening. And there will be another part that is the third part, probably uh, the last part and hope to see you once again in this lesson. Thank you and God bless you.